Okay, so um, our mathematician spotlight today is David Rockoff uh, because he's coming here tomorrow. So he's giving the colloquium tomorrow at 4.30 in Science Center 181, and there'll be snacks, which are pretty good actually, at 4.15. So David Rockoff works at the University of Arizona, and he works on differential item functioning. So what that is, <coughs> Um, a test says, a, a test contains differ, differential item functioning if people who have the same ability level but are from different subpopulations have unequal probabilities of answering correctly. So this is the most famous um, differential item functioning problem of all time. So you guys all, well most of you took the SAT and it has analogies on it. So here's the analogy. Runner is to marathon as what is to what? Envoy is to embassy, martyr is to massacre, oarsman is to regatta, or hearse as to stable, is to stable. Um, the answer is C, and if you know what an oarsman and a regatta are, it's actually a really easy question. But if you have never heard of a regatta, then it's an impossible question. And so this t question is really unfair. Um, as it says, it, like it made a huge difference oh, whether you were white or not as to whether you got this right, um, which is completely unfair. So David Rocca, this is like an egregious example, but there are other less egregious examples. So David Rockoff is working on fixing this. Um, he uses, um, he uses uh, randomization and simulations and data to try to identify um, differential item functioning in tests to see when they're unfair and then in that case eliminate those questions. So that's pretty cool. He's a, another mathematician using math to address social justice which is pretty great. So come tomorrow. Um, I'll be there if I'm not cocooning myself in some fashion, um, and uh, it will be good. So I'm excited for that. And there's a little slip here. If you want to remind yourself, take a picture of it. Good. OK. OK. So on we go. So last time, meaning last Friday, um, we did, we learned the chain rule for multivariable functions. So we figured out if a function depends on another function, which depends on another function, or se se sequence, no, a family of functions, um, how do you find partial derivatives or derivatives of those things? Um, and so this time, we'll, we'll do two new things. Um, those, we actually did scalar valued functions, so we'll look at um, vector valued functions. Um, chain, chain rule for um, vector valued functions. And then the new thing today will be directional derivatives. Um, the idea being that we have figured out the partial derivative with respect to x and the partial derivative with respect to y which tell you like the slopes if you walk in the x direction or the y direction, but what if you want to go in some other direction? So that's today. That's what we do today. So, so we talked about if you have some function like that you would have studied in um, single variable calculus, two functions that go from r to r, then you can compose them. So the derivative of f of g of x is the derivative, a different notation for this is f composed with g. So you use this little circle to mean function composition. It means f of g. Okay? And it's just the derivative of the outside function with respect to the inside function, so df with respect to g, times the derivative of the inside function with respect to x. So this is what we did the last time. Um, but how about this? What if f is a function from Rm to Rp, and uh, g is a function from Rn to Rm. Now what if we compose them? So notice that we can compose them. First you do g. g takes in a point in Rn, and it spits out a point in Rm. Now we take that point in Rm, and we put it into f, and f spits out a point in Rp. So it will work. Now we want to know, though, um, what is the derivative? So then, uh, the Jacobian, which is a big matrix of derivatives, of the composition, f composed with g, is 
Well, it's d of f composed with g. Um, it turns out it's f composed with g. By the way, f composed with g is a function from, let's see, it takes in something in Rn, and it spits out something in Rp. Well, it's just df times dg, which gives you df times dg. And all the, you know, you might be worried because you're coming from linear algebra that maybe these matrix um, dimensions won't work out right. But this is a p by m, and this is an m by n. So if you check the two inner ones match up, so it's going to work out that we can multiply them and we get a p by n. Okay. So that's how we'll do it. So it's a bit abstract. So the thing to do would be to do an example. Let's do it. Okay. <coughs> so suppose f of x, y, z is x, y, z, x plus y. So this is a function, it tells you, it takes in a point x comma y comma z, and it spits out a two-dimensional thing. So this is like f1 of x, y, z, and f2 of x, y, z. So you could think of this as like, for any point in space, we tell you a two-dimensional thing, which is like the wind direction, as just a direction vector. So is the wind going north or northeast or what? So you can think of it like that. Okay, now also, each of these guys, x and y and z, are functions of t. So suppose x of s and t, y of s and t, z of s and t, x of s and t is s times t, y of s and t is s plus t, and z of s and t is s squared minus t squared. So we're going to take each of those points and do something else. So, so in fact, each of these points depends on some other variables. So we can think of this as um, g of s t is s times t, s plus t, and s squared minus t squared. So we can think of this as like g1, g2, and g3, which are each functions of s and t. OK, so I told you you could think of this guy as like the wind direction at any point in three space. This one may be the way to think of this. OK, this function takes in any point, s comma t. So you can think of like, the, instead of the x, y plane, you can think of it as the s, t plane. Same idea. And for every, any point, it puts it in three space. So you could think of the x, y plane, or in this case, the s, t plane, as being like a rubber sheet. And it sort of brings it up and Wiggle, moves it around into three space. So it like takes this rubber sheet and bends it all around, makes some weird surface in three space. So maybe that's what this is doing. And then, so, so we want to consider f composed with g, which is a function from r2 to r2. So in this case, it would be like, you pick any point in the st plane, and it tells you what the wind direction is for that point, up in the three space thing. So. Suppose we want to linearize this thing. So, um, so, so if we want to find the Jacobian of f composed with g, it's going to be df times dg. So let's uh, compute this thing. So, df times dg. So first we need df. So df is well all the partial derivatives of these guys. So partial of f1 with respect to x partial of f1 with respect to y, partial of f1 with respect to z, and then partial of f2 with respect to x, partial of f2 with respect to y, partial of f2 with respect to z. So that's our df. And then our, for our dg, it'll be each of these functions. So partial of g1 with respect to s, partial of g1 with respect to t, and then so on. Partial of g2 with respect to s, partial of g2 with respect to t, partial of g3 with respect to s, partial of g3 with respect to t. So that's what we need. OK, let's do it. So, OK, 
We need these, these numbers. So the partial of f1 with respect to x. Can you do it? Yeah, yz. Exactly. OK, yz. And then similarly, with respect to y, it would be xz. And with respect to z, it would be xy. And then for the second function, x plus y, we want the partial of that with respect to x, which is 1, with respect to y, which is 1, and with respect to z, which is 0, because z just isn't in it at all. OK, and now we want the partials of g with respect to s and t. So the partial of this function with respect to s is t, and with respect to t is s. The partials of this with respect to s and t are both 1, and the partial of this with respect to s is 2s, and with respect to t is negative 2t. OK. OK. So that's it. Um, these are just like the parts. This will give us each of the parts of our tree, but now we need a matrix to organize them properly. Um, now, if, if you wanted, if you were just asked, oh, OK, just find the linearization in general, you'd be done. So at this point, um, you'd want to multiply out and um, substitute s and t in for x, y, z. Um, because we are really, it's because the function f composed with g is a function from r2 to r2, it just takes, it just only knows about s and t. It doesn't even know about this x, y, and z. So you need to have everything in terms of x, s, and t. And then you'd be done. So you just multiply, just do matrix multiplication and substitute in. OK, but suppose you want to know it at a certain point. So suppose um, we want to find the Jacobian um, of f composed with g at um, s, comma, t equals 1, 1. OK, well, um, the D Jacobian of f composed with g is um, df of g, o. Oh at a certain point, I should say, because that's what we're doing. So df composes g at a is um, df of g at a times dg at a. So this is, this is very much like um, the chain rule for single variable functions, except you would have like f prime. Instead of saying df, you just say f prime and g prime. And so. Maybe the thing to do here is just to figure out what g of a is. So df composed with g of 1, 1 is df of g of 1, 1 times dg of 1, 1. So if we could figure out what g of 1, 1 is, OK, let's do that. So g of 1, 1 is, OK, if we plug in 1, 1 into this function, we would get 1 times 1. 1 plus 1, 1 minus 1. OK. So it is um, 1, 2, 0. OK. So this is df at 1, 2, 0 times dg at 1, 1. OK. So let's do it. <coughs> so let's plug in. So we want this matrix now. Oops. So we want this matrix at 1, 2, 0. So if we want this at 1, 2, 0. So if your point is 1, 2, 0, y times z, can you do it? 0, this one. 0, this one. 2. OK, very nice. So this should be 0, 0, 2. And then the next line is already 1, 1, 0. Nice. OK, and then we're multiplying it by this matrix evaluated at, um, at 1, 1. So this one at 1, 1. OK. If t and s are both 1, we got what? 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, negative 2. OK. 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, negative 2. And that's it. And so then we, if we multiply this out, we get something. 4, negative 4, 2, 2. So um, it would be perfectly reasonable and correct and totally fine to multiply these matrices out, get some um, two by two matrix that had a lot, of, a lot of parts to each part, plug in the S and T functions for X and Y, and then plug in one and one for S and T. 
would work. But it may be simpler sometimes, like maybe in this case, to just figure out what x and t are, x, and, x y, and z are as functions of s and t, and then plug in. Yeah. Questions or ideas? Yeah, you think? Yeah, if you wanted to do a linearization, um, you would, so the linearization, uh, let's see, of, it's in this case, x and y, is uh, the original point, so at your, so it's, it would be f of 1, 1, f, f composed with g, f composed with g of 1, 1, plus df, times, um, like, your vector x, so x, y, minus 1, 1. So it would be f composed with g of 1, 1. Okay, so we'd have to figure out what that is. So we plug in 1, 2, 0 into f. Okay, if you plug in 1, 2, 0 into here, can you figure out what you get? 0. 3, okay, 0, 3, okay, so we would get 0, 3, okay, so basically if you're anywhere near 1, 1, you're basically about the same value, so you're about 0, 3, and then df, which we found to be 4, negative 4, 2, 2, times x minus 1, y minus 1, ah, uh, sorry, this is a plus. And so you could multiply this out and... So this, uh, this is um, L1 of xy, L2 of xy is that. So it tells you what each coordinate does as a function of, oh, 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 oh. It's in S and T, isn't it? Yeah, we said we were doing it in S and T. Sorry, T. Whew, OK. Yeah. OK, so if your point ST is close to 1, 1, the value is about the same as the value is at 1, 1, but it changes by this little amount. <coughs> yeah, good question. Yeah, other questions or ideas? Yeah. Uh, the x, y on the first line? That oh, the yeah, yeah. Also, so I just decided to change to st to be consistent with our previous notation. Good point. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, f com so we got 0, 3 because f composed with g of 1, 1. Let's see. OK, so g of 1, 1 is 1, 2, 0. And then we have to do f of 1, 2, 0 because it's f composed with g. So that we plugged in, and it is 0, 3. I didn't leave a paper trail about that. Sorry. Yeah. 0, 3 as a column vector. Yeah, 0, 3 is a column vector. But points, columns, it's as long as you're consistent. I like to switch back and forth depending on if I'm con talking, thinking of it as a vector or a point. This way, however, is confusing because I call it a point one place and a vector another place. Yeah. Just to keep you on your toes. Yeah. Yeah, other question? Okay, okay, so the next thing to talk about is directional derivatives. So, I'll start over here. Okay. As usual, we imagine that we're on some sort of lovely mountain surface, going for a hike, and we're here on the mountain at some point, maybe it's this point, and it's sitting over some point in the plain. So maybe this point in the plane here is our special point, x0, y0. And here's the underlying xy plane. So there it is. 
And if we were to walk in the x direction, well, we know what the slope would be in that direction. It's partial of f with respect to x. So that's if we went in this direction. And if we were to walk in the y direction, uh, we know what the slope would be in that direction. That's the partial derivative with respect to y. But maybe you want to walk in some other direction, like this direction. Here it is, some other direction. Maybe you want to walk in the direction AB. So you want to know, what would the slope be if I walk in direction AB? Yeah, so far, we only know what the slope would be if you walk in the two cardinal directions, like only north or only east. That's it. So if you're willing to walk like an Etch-a-Sketch, like a little north, and then a little east, and then a little north, and then a little east, all good. We can tell you your slopes. But if you want to walk in some other direction, you have to come to class today. And that's what, that's what we're doing. So that's the idea of today, is to figure out how to find this thing in some other direction. So in order to figure this out, we're, we're going to put together a couple of things we've already done. First, writing equations for lines. And second, the chain rule. That's why this didn't come up until now, because we didn't have the chain rule. So our dream is to find um, the directional derivative, which you can think of as the slope of um, f of x, y at some point x naught y not in the direction of the vector a, b. So um, what we'll do is first we'll write the equation of a line in that direction. So like if we took this yellow vector down here and we extended it to be an entire line. So, um, so the line through x naught, and maybe we'll put this in vector form now, through x naught, y naught, in direction a, b. Um, the line is like x of t, y of t is, OK, well, you start here. You start here at x naught, y naught. And then you go in this direction, a, b. So like a, b, and then you go for some amount of time, t. Um, we did this very back at the beginning of the class, but the way you can think about it is if t is 0, this whole term drops out, and you're just at your startling point, x0, y0. If t is 1, then you've gone one, one vector a, b along the way. If t is 2, you've gone two vectors a, b in that direction. If t is negative 1, you've gone negative 1. If t is pi, you know, t is any number, that just gives you the entire, all the points on this line. OK, and so then you could write it also as x0 plus a t, y naught plus b t. And what we really want is that we want to know um, how f changes with t. So if I want to know my slope in that direction, I really mean like if I go one foot in that direction or one minute in that direction, how does my z value change? So I want. Um, df dt. Because f here, let's see, f, so we'll do f as a function of x and y. And then y, x and y are both functions of t. So we'll want df dt. Question? So, someone's saying a secret question, but you could tell everyone and be their hero. <coughs> oh, if you do, you can have a pentagon. Wait, let me get it. OK, if you ask your question out loud, you can have a pentagon. No, OK, I couldn't figure out who it was. So you get no pentagon. Next time, no. OK. OK. So. Um, df dt, which is a total derivative, not a partial derivative, because at this level f only depends on t, is how we get to t from the left and also you know, how f depends on t from the right. So it's the partial of f with respect to x, that's this bit, times dx dt, plus the partial of f with respect to y times dy dt. OK, OK, let's try to figure out what we can. So partial of f with respect to x, 
We do know what it is because we weren't given a function f. It's just whatever it is. So it's just partial of f with respect to x. dx dt. That we know. Can you do dx dt? Yeah, it's just a because x0 is a constant and a is a coefficient of t. This is times a. And then again, partial of f with respect to y. We don't know it because we don't it's whatever it is for our function. But then dy dt is b. OK, so we know this. And then this is a trick we used before. If you have something times something plus something times something, you say dot product. So this is partial of f with respect to x, comma, partial of f with respect to y, dot a, comma, b. Um, and this partial of f with respect to y, x, comma, partial of f with respect to y, we gave a name for that before. It's the gradient. Yeah, nice. So this is the gradient of f, and let's, um, let's evaluate it at our point x0, y0, dot ab, in whatever direction you want to write your vector. Let's write it like this. Or ab is a column vector, either one. OK. So this is how you figure out your, your directional derivative, or your slope, in direction ab. Now, there's just one other thing to say. Which is that I want to know like um, how f changes with t, but I'd really like to know like if I go one foot in the direction of vector a b, how many feet does my z value change, or one meter, one unit? If I go one unit in this direction a b, how does my f change? So I really want this to be a unit vector. Because think about it. So I just want to know what my slope is in this direction. Suppose I compute this number. OK. Then suppose I say, oh, well, actually, I really want this to be a fancy looking direction, so I'm going to multiply this direction vector by 100. My slope shouldn't change in that direction. It's still the same direction that I'm walking. So I, I want this to be a unit vector. So we'll always take this to be a unit vector. So the takeaway message. Is that the, here's and here's some notation too. So um, the directional derivative, d means derivative, in the direction of unit vector u of the function f evaluated at the point x naught y naught. So this is um, the directional derivative of f at x naught y naught in the direction of unit vector u is the gradient of f at your point x0, y0 dot u. Yeah. So that's the message. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this notation, it might seem a little unhandy, like, hey, couldn't you have come up with a better thing, please? But it, it just packs all the thing. I'm taking a derivative. I want it in the, this direction of this vector. This is my function. And this is the point I'm standing at on my mountain. So that's it. Yeah. OK, so let's try one. So find um, the directional derivative of f of x, y is x squared minus y squared um, at the point 3, comma 1 in the direction if I walk in the direction 1, comma 2. OK, that's, that's the thing. So here's my x, y plane. Um, or my map, essentially of my mountain range. I'm standing here at the point 3, comma 1, and I'm wanting to walk in this direction 1, comma 2. And I want to know, am I going to be ascending, descending? How steeply? Do I need my pickaxe? Should I get some ropes? Will I need to use my hands? Do I need to wear something better than flip-flops? It's a compelling question. So. 
let's do it. So first, uh, we should find um, the gradient of f just in general. So we need the partial derivative of this function with respect to x and with respect to y. So with respect to x, 2x. With respect to y, negative 2y. Nice. And then we want it at 3, comma 1. So plug in 3 and 1, 6, negative 2. OK? Um, now we want um, a unit vector for our direction. So our direction, our direction um, for direction for our direction that we were given, which was 1, 2. So we should just find its length. Its length is 5. And we just divide by the length. So u is 1 over root 5, comma 2 over root 5. OK? And then finally, we'll take a dot product. So the direction, next actual derivative, and the direction of unit vector 1 over root 5, comma 2 over root 5 of f, evaluated at 3, 1. Whew, is the gradient, so that's 6, comma, negative 2, dot the unit vector. So that's 1 over root 5, comma, 2 over root 5. OK, so we just do it. So 6 times 1 over root 5 is 6 over root 5, plus negative 2 times 2 over root 5 is negative 4 over root 5. So that's 2 over root 5. Okay. Yeah, question? How did I get this to be? So I took, so um, I, I had this direction vector, 1, 2, but it's not a unit vector. It's longer than a unit vector. So I have to divide it by its length, which I did in my head as root 5. Yeah, good question. Yeah. OK, so we have found that the directional derivative in direction, the direction of vector 1, comma 2 is 2 over root 5. So are we ascending or descending? Ascending, yeah, because this number is positive. Is it steep or not steep? Yeah, it's, OK, it's subjective. Is the slope more than 1 or less than 1? So yeah, it's less than 1, but close to 1, right? This is like. If this was 2 over 2, the slope would be 1. It's 2 over root 5, so the slope is a little bit less than 1. I allege that if I were to ask you to climb this thing, you would think it was steep. OK, okay. so the slope is not super big because it's a little bit less than 1. But this hill is pretty steep. Yeah, probably shouldn't wear flip-flops. Closed-toe shoes recommended. OK, good. So the last thing that we'll do is to think about the gradient and what it tells us. So um, suppose we are on this mountain. And um, we're sort of trying to, it's not that we know that we want to go in the direction of the yellow vector. <coughs> we actually want to decide which way to go. So we want to know some things. If I'm standing here, or here on the map, <clears throat> which way should I go to ascend most steeply? Which way should I go? So that's if, I, if I'm just, I just want to get to the top of the mountain. That's it. I just want to go the steepest way towards the top. Which way should I go? That's question number one. The second question is, suppose I want to descend most steeply. So maybe I'm, like a storm is coming and I just want to get off the mountain. Or maybe I have a drop of water. Right? If it rains, a drop of water takes the path of steepest descent. Descent. So you might want to know which direction will a path of water take? Which direction will the stream go through this point? And then the, finally, I want to know which way should I go if I don't want to, if I want to walk flat. I don't want to ascend or descend at all. I just want to go on a nice little nature walk, not ascend or descend at all. Those are my three questions. So let's attack them one at a time. So which direction should I go to ascend most steeply? So to attack this, <clears throat> or to answer this, consider that what we're doing is the gradient of f at x, y dot unit vector u in the direction that you're going. So 
if you're here at your point, the, the gradient goes in some direction. You can't change that. It's, it is what it is. But you get to decide which way, you get to decide which way you go. So you get to decide vector u. So one thing we know about dot products is that it's equal to the magnitude of the first vector times the magnitude of the second vector times the cosine of the angle between them. Do you remember this thing? Um, it, it, this, this tells us that the dot product is like a measure of how much two vectors point in the same direction. If the dot product comes out positive, they're in the same direction. If it comes out negative, they're in opposite directions. If it comes out zero, they're perpendicular. So this theta, cosine of theta, is the angle between f and whichever vector u I pick. And since u is a unit vector, this is just the magnitude of the gradient times the cosine of the angle between my direction and the gradient. OK, so this is going to be our thing that we use. So if I want to ascend most steeply, I want this to be a big positive number. So what should cosine theta be? 1, yeah. So you want um, cosine theta to be 1. So you want theta to be 0. And what that means is you pick a u that's in the same direction as f. So this tells you that u and f are in the same direction. So it tells you that if you want to climb most steeply, you should walk in the direction of the gradient. So this tells you that the gradient is the direction of steepest ascent. Which is kind of amazing. Um, because if you take partial derivative with respect to x, comma partial derivative with respect to y, and you just make them into a vector, it isn't clear that that vector would have any meaning at all. But it has meaning, and in fact, it has a useful meaning. It tells you which way to go to climb most steeply. OK, suppose you're now a drop of water. So which direction to descend most steeply? What do you think? Yeah. It's the opposite direction. Yeah, it's the opposite direction. We want to go exactly the opposite direction. Cosine theta would be negative 1. So cosine theta would be negative 1. So theta would be pi. So f and u in opposite directions. So um, steepest descent direction is negative the gradient of f. Yeah. So the water. But the, what a water droplet does <coughs> is it calculates the gradient, and then it goes in the opposite direction. And then for the new spot, it calculates the gradient, and it goes in the opposite direction, and so on. Clearly, that's what a water droplet is doing, right? Yeah. OK. And how about, finally, um, which direction to um, walk on the level? Um, one answer, yeah. Yeah, what would we, yeah, what should we do? Yeah, t t uh, Daniel? Uh, so just uh, you go perpendicular to the gradient? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just go perpendicular to the gradient. So notice that you have, so notice that to do the steepest ascent, you go in the direction of the gradient. The steepest descent is the opposite direction of the gradient. And then to go level, you have to go perpendicular. So to go level, you actually have two choices. Because, you know, cosine theta could be pi over 2 or negative pi over 2. So you can go perpendicular to the gradient, to the left or the right. Um, another way of thinking about this is that it's along a level curve. So no matter where you are, whatever your elevation is there, there's a level curve at that elevation. So perhaps it looks something like this. So maybe there is a bunch of level curves on your hiking map that looks something like this. The gradient is always perpendicular to the level curves. It either, it either goes this way or it goes that way, and you just have to look which direction the number is going up. So that's pretty neat. Yeah? If you're at a max or a min, how does this work? Does the gradient not have a direction? If you're at a max or a min, uh, the gradient is 0. Okay. Yeah, just like if you drop a droplet of water at a max or a min, it doesn't move. Yeah. Is that obvious? It's not. It will become obvious. Yeah, OK. Yeah. 
So um, let's just do one example. So again, using this stuff. So um, for f of x, y is x squared minus y squared, the same function as before, um, at the point 3 comma 1, the same point as before, um, what is uh, the direction of um, steepest ascent? It's somewhere on the board, the answer. Yeah, six. So it's it is the direction of gradient of the gradient of f at three one, which we already computed to be um, six negative two. Um, usually, you want to give your answer as a unit vector, so we could divide this by its length. I think six squared is thirty six. Negative two squared is four. Thirty six plus four is forty. So the unit vector in that direction would be 6 over root 40, negative 2 over root 40. <clears throat> okay. Um, how about if you, um, direction of, of no change. So if I wanted to do steepest descent, I would just make this negative. What if I want a direction of no change? What would you do? So um, you might not have done this before. If you have a slope and you want a perpendicular slope, you do the negative reciprocal. And in vectors, it's very much the same. Um, you switch x and y, and you make one of them negative. So I'm laughing at my voice because it's changed so much. So you switch these. You get negative 2 over root 40, comma 6 over root 40. But now you switch the sign of one of them. So let's say we just switch this. We make them both negative. Or you switch the sign of the other one positive 2 over root 40, comma 6 over root 40. And these are opposite directions that both go along the level curve. It's like whether you decided to go left along the hiking trail or right along the hiking trail. Yeah. Yeah. OK. All right. That's it. Thank you. OK.